Rowan. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce Tom Wind, who is, I think, the number one wind expert here in the state of Iowa. Absolutely. And uh, I've known Tom for a number of years. Tom and I were both on the Iowa Power Plant, and we're instrumental in getting that $100 million that Governor Culver had uh, asked the legislature for, for energy independence. And we got some really great projects going there. Um, if you have a chance over lunch to talk to him about that, it was fabulous. It really, really was. Um, and Tom is, uh, has his own company, and he advises on wind turbines. Uh, but I think his passion really is community wind. And so I've invited him here today, and uh, I'm just so, so very thrilled to introduce him and to him you know, introduce you to Lakeside Lab, which is a wonderful facility here. And you might want to talk to them a little bit about your background and the company that you have. Okay? All right. Thank you very much, Thank Tom. you very much. Very generous and kind introduction, Pat, and uh, not quite as uh, good as oh, that you portray me to be here, but and, and important. But nevertheless, uh, my name is Wind, and, uh, you know, and, and, and people say, well, did you change your name? And, and then I just finally give up and admit, well, I did, you know, rather than argue with them that I really didn't. I just say, yeah, yeah, it used to be Joe Wynn. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm an electrical engineer and graduated from Iowa State University a long time ago, 1974. Worked for electric utility for about 15 years and uh, then went back to the family farm, of all things, and farmed uh, for about five years back at my family farm near Jefferson. And then also at the same time, I started doing consulting on the side and consulted about power, and energy, energy efficiency, power, looking into the future. How do we meet our electric power needs? And then one of my clients uh, in the town of Waverly, Iowa said, Tom, we are interested in putting up a wind turbine. Could you help us out? And I didn't know anything about wind turbines other than just a general knowledge of, of them. And so I helped them out and then that launched my career into wind power. So I've been working uh, in wind power uh, for about 20 years now. So, uh, and, uh, and that's what the majority of the work I do is involved with wind power. So what I wanna talk to you today about is uh, why Iowa has so many wind turbines. And then I wanna talk a little bit about what we term the community owned wind turbine projects. First of all, are all of you from Iowa? Yes. Okay, who, and all of you have seen wind farms. And how many of you have taken a tour of a wind farm? All of us. Ask how many climbed to the top of a wind farm. Many, you're kidding me. Have some of you climbed to the top of a wind farm? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't believe that. That's I, got, I got a bunch of them. <laughs> So which, uh, which wind farm did you go to? We were at Iowa Lakes Community College. Oh, okay. In Manhattan, so. Okay, very good. So uh, that's uh, wonderful. Most, when I ask that question most times, I rarely get a, a person to raise their hand. So uh, the way I'd like to run this today is that uh, I don't, it's not necessary for me to get through all my slides. I've got plenty of slides here. I think it's more important to answer your questions. So as we go along, and if you think of a question, uh, go ahead and answer it at the time, and I may defer you to a slide I have a little later, but let's just get the answers out to uh, what it what is for you. So, uh, why does Iowa have so many wind turbines? You know, that's really a good question. I've been involved with the wind industry here in Iowa for such a long time, I'm kind of the right guy to answer it. There's maybe a handful of people in Iowa that can have the history of wind power going back. And I've lived part of that history and then talked to others that have been involved with it. But I first want to start with what Iowa really is like. This is the land elevation in Iowa. And the highest elevation is the brown areas and the lowest elevation is down here at Cape Town. And as you know, it's relatively flat. It's not as hilly as this map would portray. And you know, the elevation up here is about 1,600 feet and it's around 800 and some feet down here. And then if you look at the other important characteristic of Iowa, what's, it's the land cover. What, what, uh, what is on the surface of the land? And all of the orange area in the map is our crop, our crops. So it's 
cultivated farm. And then the areas with a little bit of tan or lighter yellow in it are grasslands or pastures. And of course, we have a few cities in the purple there. But you can see that the vast majority of this is, uh, is cropland, meaning there's not many trees there. And if you put together these two pieces of information, which is, would be the uh, elevation and the land cover, along with some test towers testing the wind speed uh, of, in certain areas, you can develop what we call is a wind speed map of the state of Iowa. And the windiest spots are the brown areas, and the least windy spots are the blue areas. Now, how come there's a blue area right through here? River Valley. Yeah, it's a river valley. And what do you have near river valleys? Bluffs. Trees. Trees. And it's lower in elevation. Valleys. Generally, as you go higher in elevation, the wind uh, picks up. This is the highest spot right up there, but it's not the windiest. <coughs> Generally, that would be the windiest. So why do you think this area in Pocahontas and Calhoun County is windier? Nothing there. Plus. Pardon me? The flattest? Yeah, and what else about them besides flatness? No trees. No trees. How many of you, are, any of you live in those counties? Long time. Yeah, you realize just hardly anything up there, right? It's just so flat and they're bulldozing the farmstead. So, and, and Mid America has built some large wind farms in there, and that's just a really great place to put wind farms. So, this is what we have as islands for energy resources. Now, on this map, I also plotted all the oil wells they have. They're little black dots. And you see them on the map. And then you'll see the coal mines, the active coal mines we have. Those are the gray shaded areas. And then the natural gas wells that we have, and all of the fracked wells that we have, they're in blue, blue dots on here. And then the large hydroelectric facilities those are in green, green shaded areas. So there are no blue dots, there are no black dots, there are no gray areas. The point is, when you're looking at energy resources, we don't really have any. No fossil fuel resources to speak of. The hydroelectric facilities that we have are, are really very small in, compared to the energy we have. This is it. This is our energy resources, our most abundant abundant energy resource. Wind power, and of course, the sun that shines on, on the state. So, uh, the energy crisis first spurred us into action. How many of you were around for the 1974 energy crisis? What was it like to you? What, what, how do you characterize that? I was working at a gas station. Um, it was my junior year in high school. And, you know, the OPEC nations did their thing, and get jack, gas jumped from like 30-something to 55 cents, and people went absolutely nuts, and we ran out of gas. And there were lines, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a small town, and, you know, it's just amazing to see that kind of thing, because, you know, you're not, you're not used to that. But, but we run out of gas, and we'd have to put our sign up, no gas today, and people would just, they were so upset. Right. Anybody else have a comment about the energy crisis? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That, that's when we first, I, when I started college at that time, <coughs> first started talking about solar energy and wind energy about that time. Because we almost thought that we were going to run out of gas, or we couldn't understand why there's a shortage. And the OPEC were so dependent upon overseas suppliers of energy. And here we got, why can't we use renewable energy? And, and there's a, Electric cars that were invented or in, uh, implemented about that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the fleet of it, uh, electric cars. Yeah. I went to Iowa State and and the fella that I rode home with, I didn't have my own car, I rode home with him. We went 40 miles per hour all the way home from Iowa State to, I lived over by Makokita. Because that was how you got your best gas yeah, mileage. Yeah. I never <laughs> rode with him again. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then there was the girl who had the hot date that I rode with once. We went 90 miles an hour from Ames to Clarence, right, on 30. I never rode with her again either. <laughs> we ain't got driven an hour and a half. It was scary. That, that wasn't an energy crisis. <laughs> no. Wasn't that about the time when we... Uh, 
I guess it was Nixon, established the 55 mile an hour speed limit. Yeah, that was in, res that was in response to the energy crisis. What was the speed limit previous to that? Well, we were just talking about the other day. 60. It, it was higher than that. Was, wasn't it 70 on the state highways? Yeah. But, but the, like the common, like this 86, was 60 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. depending where you were at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because Iowa has had essentially no usable fossil fuels, we had a couple, couple of small coal mines that were really very cold. The Iowa DNR formed this energy bureau, and it started you know, studying this and talking about it and preaching it and put out a report every year. Here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to do. They started a long-term education process that, uh, that made a difference in the state of Iowa. And then the Iowa legislature responded. It was 1983, after about two energy crises that we had, they came up with the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard. In other words, it was a mandate that required 2% of the electricity that the utilities sold was to come from renewable energy. <coughs> that would be about 250 megawatts of wind turbines. And at the time that was passed, it was very controversial. No state had ever required its, its utilities to do such a thing. Now in California, they had some wind turbines. The first wind farms were installed you know, about this time or a little bit below before 1983. But they were not mandated, they were incentivized through very generous tax credits that the state had passed. So when this happened, this was very controversial. And as such, uh, there was a period of what we call a discussion after that. Utilities simply didn't want to do it. They said, hey, this is impractical, it's going to cost too much, ratepayers don't want this, you know, all those things that, that happened. So as a result, nothing really happened for a while. And it was the Spirit Lake School District, you know, right here. Harold Overman, the superintendent, he started the ball rolling in Iowa with wind power. Strange that you'd have all these utilities uh, and, and lots of municipals, lots of cities, and who takes the first step? A school district. Why would a school district want to put up a wind turbine? What do they know about wind turbine? They're not in the business of generating their own electricity. But Harold was strong-willed. He had to be, have been strong-willed because it was uh, uh, because uh, he was the first entity in the state to do this. It was 1992, and it was a very difficult process. And uh, difficult because the utility said, you can't do this. It just, it's not going to work. It's, it's not going to pay for itself. And there was a, kind of a, 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 a very difficult negotiation in there. Had not Harold uh, kind of pulled some uh, political moves on the utility, it wouldn't have happened. So it was Harold Overman's, you know, maybe overbearing personality. It might not be the right way to say it, but his determination to get it done. So they installed the first wind turbine in in 1992, it cost about a quarter of a million dollars, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. They got a state grant, uh, for, or excuse me, a federal grant for part of it, and they got a low interest loan from the state of Iowa. The project was successful because of two factors. One is that Iowa utilities, Iowa, the state of Iowa required utilities to offer a net meter, and the second is the structure of Alliance Electric. The Alliance is the utility that served that area. First of all, net metering. It's just a policy that says if you put up a wind turbine, there's going to be times when your wind turbine is going to generate more power than you need. And that power is going to go backwards through the meter onto the grid. And a net metering policy says, okay, utility, when the power goes backwards, you give the customer credit for those kilowatt hours. And then when the, the wind's not blowing and you need power, you let the uh, you, uh, customer have those kilowatt hours back for free. You're kind of using the utility to bank that. That makes a big difference in the economics. It really does. And so net metering was a policy that Iowa is, uh, established. And the second was a nice electric rate. And all I need to tell you is that most large facilities, like schools, they're elect they buy electricity. There's a couple parts in their electric bill, three main components. And one of them is just the kilowatt hours that they, that they use of their meter. The second one is the the highest rate that they use during the month, or the peak. 
And because of that, uh, if you have try to make a wind turbine economic on a customer that's got these two parts of their electric rate, it just won't work because the wind doesn't blow every day. The wind doesn't reduce the peak load of the facility because there will be some day during the month when the wind's not blowing and the facility's at this peak and this electric bill will be higher. So it's just, it worked out that this, uh, these two factors lined up for this particular school district and it made it work. And it was all these little things that occurred, ha having Harold Overman, having the net metering, having Alliance Electric Terrar uh, just uh, design that particular way that the turbine actually paid for itself in about six to seven years, which was a, a, a very fast payback period, very fast payback period. Most utility investments in generation are depreciated over a minimum of 20 to 25 years. And here we have an electric generator that paid for itself in seven years. So. More small wind turbine projects were built. George Braxman, have, any, have anybody have heard of him before? He lives near Allendorf, and he installed five 65 kilowatt rebuilt turbines. Uh, and these came from California, he installed them on his farm uh, right south of Allendorf. These were not fancy turbines. These were taken from California, taken out of service, brought back to Iowa. And they were lattice towers, and they weren't fancy or anything like that. But he installed them and he sold the power uh, to Alliant Utilities. And then, the next year, 1983, a retired banker and his sister <coughs> donated two wind turbines to Nevada. One to the county, uh, Story County Hospital in Nevada, and the second one to the school system. That's quite a donation. Most people give money. This guy gave wind turbines. Why? He just liked wind turbines. He thought they were cool. And he thought, what gift can I give that keeps on giving, on giving, on giving each year? Rather than giving a pot of money and have it be all spent, a wind turbine provides an on, ongoing gift. How many of you have seen the wind turbines there in Nevada? And there's two now at the school and then one at the hospital. And then, uh, at, oh, excuse me, and the, the one by the hospital, it's really not by the hospitals, by the sewage treatment plant. And they worked out a deal. At the hospital, they couldn't install it, but the sewage treatment plant had room, and they said, I'll tell you what, we'll make that a deal. We'll put it at the sewage, hospital, sewage treatment plant, and whatever money we save in the power bill, our power bill, we'll just write you a check and send it to the hospital. And so that's what they ended up doing. So more projects follow, 24 turbines by 1998. And so here's a little graph uh, showing the wind turbines that were installed. Here's the Spirit Lake Schools and Proxima's. Nevada put, uh, uh, had two wind turbines that are at the hospital and the school. And you can see uh, here's a farmer, my miller, over by Brett, that Spirit installed. Schaefer Manufacturing, that's a dare. How many of you seen the wind turbine at a dare, the little one that was right by the interstate there? Guess what? Have any of you guys seen it lately? It's gone. It's now serving a new life, I think, up in Alaska. The owners uh, sold the winter. Why did they sell the winter? Well, did you remember where that winter was installed? It was about 25 feet from the building. And there was a little manufacturing building right there. And they had it installed back in 1994. In all these years, it never caused a problem, but one, but it was about two years ago, a chunk of ice came off the blade, flung over the building into the parking lot on the north side, and cracked a window on a car. And that really spooked them. And they thought, well, this could be dangerous. And so the insurance company also said, yeah, this could be dangerous. You ought to do something about it. So they turned the wind turbine off for the rest of the winter, in fact. And uh, then they turned it on again next summer and said, let's just sell this to someplace else. They installed it too close to a building. You know, modern standards would say, no, no, you got to keep wind turbines away from people because things can happen for safety purpose. But it was remarkable that it went from 1994 to about 2010 before they ever had a problem. So that's 16 years before they ever had a problem with ice on it. But anyway, that wind turbine is now gone and it's someplace else. 
But over this period of time, in 1988, there was a total of 24 wind turbines that were installed. And look at the number of schools that were involved in here that, had, that, that uh, got wind turbines. And then after 1998, a few more schools even installed wind turbines. But I think this is strange that uh, the wind industry in Iowa was led by a school, led by a school and other, and other individual uh, people here. Did you have a question? I do. Do you know what happens to the wind turbines to these schools that kind of disappear, like Central of Fenton? They're not in anymore. <clears throat> do, does Alliant take them back over, or? No, usually not. Uh, Alliant doesn't, uh, wouldn't have any use for a small turbine like that. And uh, in some cases, the school just, the, the turbines, that one was a rebuilt one out of California, so it was on its second life. And it just becomes uh, more costly and to maintain, and so they just take them down. They find somebody that will buy it, and then they'll you know give it to them for next to nothing usually, and then they just remove it. Any other questions? So all of these wind turbines, we call them community-owned wind turbines because the community owned them, or individuals in the community not large companies, not utilities, but individuals. George Braxman had a lot of nerve to you know, put up those first turbines there. And uh, individual people like the guy that owned the Boondocks Motel, he just loved wind turbines. So he wanted to sell them. So remember that the state of Iowa, the legislator mandated that 2% of the electricity come from Wind turbines. So how did we, Iowa, get to 2%? Because in 1983, after they passed the law, nothing happened. So the Iowa Utility Board started uh, a process. And it, was, it took them a while. And then there were legislative challenges. Once the law was passed, the utilities tried to undo the law. Say, like, we don't need this. And so every year, they would try to uh, undo the law. Then there were legal challenges. And utilities did not want the wind power, and they challenged it at the federal level, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They challenged it at the state level, the district court level. They challenged it everywhere. And then the legislature said, hey, this is going a little slow. Maybe we should talk about providing some incentives. And so they came up with a reduction in property taxes. They said, okay, every, you know, the property, property taxes are paid on everything. Let's give them a break on property taxes. Let's phase the property tax in over seven years, and then let's cap it about at 30% of uh, full value. And that is a reduction probably of about 50% in property taxes over, over the life of a wind turbine. And then they eliminated the sales tax. They had already eliminated sales tax on some large equipment. And they said, you don't need to pay the 5 or 6% sales tax on a wind turbine. And then they said, OK. You know, we have this power plant siting law. That if you're going to build a big power plant, you've got to submit an application, go through this long process. And, and you know what? Don't bother us with a wind farm. If you can work out a deal with the farmers and everybody's happy and everybody signs on the dotted line, we don't care. Do you know how, how much easier that makes the world when you can do that yourself and negotiate something and make everybody happy and then you don't have to get any more approvals. So that made a, a big difference. And then Iowa's three major utilities, after fighting this for such a long time, they ran out of all of their options and they finally said, okay, uncle, we give up. And then they contracted with three developers, uh, and two developers in 1999, and, or a year before, and then they finally installed the wind turbines in 1999 they installed a total of 230 megawatts. And all of this power was sold to the three main utilities that we had at that time. So they were under long-term contract. And these installations finally fulfilled the utility's obligations. They're done, they thought. Got it over with. We're paying for this power. We hope this never happens again. And so the Here's the, here is the first wind turbine that was installed by Spirit Lake Schools right there. And then uh, two wind farms were installed at, uh, by Storm Lake. How many of you have seen the, wind, the, the original wind turbines that were installed uh, west of Storm Lake? 
What's different about those wind turbines? They have an open base. It's a lattice structure. Yeah, it's a lattice tower. All new wind turbines now are tubular. Why do you think they did that? Because that's what the farmers around had. That's the type of windmills they had. No, that wasn't the reason. Cheap. Easy to construct. Cheap, yeah. Cheap, you're right. And it's cheap. First time, first cost was cheap. But guess what they learned after that? Maintenance. It wasn't so cheap after all. Why? Well, what do you think happened? Safety. Well, Faster yeah. skin moves. Faster skin moves. They started, what are these nuts doing on the ground here? You know? They're, like, oh, they're falling up and they're coming loose. So they had to go and tighten, retighten, torque all the bolts. That's all the way. Put little, what do you call it, lock nuts on there. Yep. Yep. And then guess what else they found out that's not very nice about open lattice towers? Corrosive. Pardon me? Corrosive. No, no. What else? Affects the wind. No. Flexes. Well, they flex, but that's not a problem. Things climb at them? No. Keep close. Come on, keep going along that line. What if you were a maintenance a wind technician and it was 20 degrees below zero outside, cold, and you had to climb <coughs> outside, and the higher you get, the faster the wind blows. Just think of the wind chill you'd have just getting up to the, the cell. So the guys didn't like them very well. Guess what? That was the last lattice towers in the United States that were installed. And what else is unique about those wind turbines? What color are the blades? They were originally black. Why did they did black? Most wind turbine blades are white. Why did these guys put up black? Absorb this. I didn't think they did. Absorb the heat. Yeah. Yeah. Absorb heat. Make yeah. them longer, make them think that Or to go around faster. We did dry. Oh. Nice. Did you yeah. say icing? Yeah. 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 So the meteorologists do a study and they put the little test towers up at the little anemometer and say, hey, sometimes those anemometer cups freeze solid and they won't turn. Yeah. Oh, we don't want to affect the blades because a little coating of ice, just like an airplane wing, you know, if you get a little coating of ice, you can't fly because it affects the aerodynamics. It does the same thing with the wind turbine. It just cuts the power in half. So let's make them black, let the sun melt the ice off. And so, well, that was the last black blades built in the United States because the black so helped a little bit, but it also caused problems because in the summer, it just absorbed heat and it just was harder on the materials and blades. So very unique wind farms. So two wind farms are, were built right there. And then the third wind farm was over here. It's about 257 turbines here and 56 turbines over here. How many of you have seen this wind farm south of Clear Lake? 56 turbines. I thought that was a big deal when that went in. Well, going beyond 2%. Well, the major <coughs> utilities fought the initial requirement. But then what happened next was what I call magic. In 2001, two years later, a fourth wind farm of 80 megawatts is installed north of Clear Lake called the Top of Iowa Wind Farm. How many of you may have seen that one? North of Clear Lake. Yeah. And then in 2002, a fifth wind farm installed west of Garner in Hancock County. A gazillion wind turbines there. 148, 660 kilowatt turbines. And then a sixth wind farm in 2003, lake, uh, west of where we are right now. How many have seen the wind farm just west of here? The first GE turbines. So why did these happen? All of this power was sold to one utility. It was sold to Alliant Energy primarily and to a couple of cooperatives. Wasn't the one that was originally built in Clear Lake, the electricity was sold to a power company in Florida? A power company? <coughs> Near Clear Lake? A power yeah, company I thought Florida. the one that went up at Clear Lake, they were, the electricity was all going to Florida. It was a Florida company that built it. Okay. The power was sold to Alliant. <clears throat> so what happened was the utility said, hey, you know, this wind power is okay, you know, we can manage it, and and the price, the wind turbines are getting more efficient, the price of wind turbines are coming down. And the and the same guys that built the first wind farms and sold the power said, hey, do you want some more? We got a better price for you this time. And so it, it turned out that it was economic. So the utility said, hey. Yeah, I think we can take some more of this. 
So all of those were built for private uh, developers. So by the end of 2003, there were 600 turbines in Iowa. Or we got about 4% of our electricity from wind turbines uh, by that year. So more policy changes were proposed in, by the uh, utility board. One was the siting of 34.5 feet electric transmission lines. Before you had to turn in franchise application in the state, you go through a hearing process, and they say, okay, yeah, you can build a transmission line at this point. And they said, oh, the utility board said, oh, forget it. All the wind turbines are connected by 34.5 kV lines, but they're buried underground. They don't affect anything. So they said, don't bother us with this. If you can get an agreement with the local landowner, that's good. So that change made it easier to build wind farms. And then uh, the legislature uh, allowed utilities to own wind turbines. Initially, they said, nope, you can't own them. You just have to buy it from somebody else. mid America said, hey, I think this is a good deal for us and our customers, we'd like to own them. So they passed legislation to allow that to happen. So all of this resulted in Mid-American investing in wind generation and Alliant. And it turns out they are the two big champions of wind power in the state of Iowa. It's the two big utilities. <clears throat> and so, and then Iowa provided an incentive for what we call community-owned wind generation which was a 10 year, one and a half cent per dollar <laughs> sellable tax credit. That's about $70,000 a year for a big wind turbine as a state tax credit. And that was for small projects, for, for an individual or a farmer or a business that wants to install a wind turbine, they can get that tax credit. So, uh, and then after that, the Iowa Power Fund, which uh, Pat uh, referred to, they invested in demonstration research and education. They put some money aside and gave it to the university, said, hey, help everybody out, study the problems and issues we have with wind power and, and provide solutions. So today, we have 3,200 wind turbines totaling 5,100 megawatts, 25% of electricity coming out of that socket right there, on average around the state, 25% coming out of the socket is from wind power. That is the highest in uh, the second highest in this in the United States. Well, no, it's the highest this year. It's the highest this year. Here's a map showing where all the wind turbines are. If you want to count, there's 3,200 dots on this map. They're not oil wells. They're better than oil wells because they're renewable and they don't pollute. And uh, for example, uh, right here uh, in Story County, there's about 200 turbines here, you, although you can't tell them. And then if there's an individual turbines right here, I make the dots bigger so that you can see them. So we have individual, individual large turbines now, not little turbines, large turbines here. And these are the community wind projects where farmers get together and they own wind turbines. And uh, right here in Green County, this is I live right here. And uh, I'm, I have part ownership in the middle of seven turbines right there, and I also, my family owns some of these, uh, some of this wind generation right here. And that's why I the Grand Junction Island. I'm invested in wind generation. I put my money into wind generation. I'm what I'm part of the community owned wind generation. So, a lot of wind turbines. Tom, uh, I have a question for you. Yes. I'm from Calhoun County. Yes. If you look at Calvin County, and you look at the wind potential map there, um, however, if you look at the where the turbines are sited, there are virtually none in Calvin County. Yeah. I mean, we have them directly north of us, to south of Pocahontas, and we have them, you know, southeast of us, just north of Carroll, between Carroll and Breda. Yeah. Hundreds of them, but Why none in Calvin County. Out? You got sheep. Yeah. We have none. Why? Yeah, that's my question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Mid American. That's the best place to put right there, Calhoun County, besides Pocahontas. They just uh, don't like the board of supervisors there? Transmission problems? Yeah, transmission. They ran out of transmission lines. If they want more, they got to build yeah, new transmission more. lines just to get the power out of there. Do you know how much power Calhoun County uses? I would guess about 30 megawatts. Yeah. yeah, here, right here, there's about 200 megawatts right there. So that power's just got to get the heck out of there because people don't use it there. 
So that's the problem. In fact, we're going to have a slide that talks about that in just a second. Now, I have talked about small turbines. These are 1 to 100 kilowatts. These are the ones you find up at a farm, a small, where they put it one up and running a, like a hog and find it, like a building, or one for a homeowner. These are where those small turbines are. The big circles <coughs> are not related to, they're related to the size. For example, this is a 100 kilowatt turbine right there. And you see, they're clustered all over the state of Ohio. And, uh, and they're not necessarily in the windy areas because the reason people put these in is because they want to. They like wind turbines and they just uh, think it's a neat thing. And a lot of farmers now, some of the farmers are starting to, uh, where they have a hog confiner or something like that, they'll, they'll, they're finding that they can put in a, like a 50 kilowatt turbine. <coughs> that big. So this is a lot of small wind turbines. No other state, I think, has this many small wind turbines other than maybe California. So what does Iowa do to support wind power? Wind power? So the Iowa Wind Energy Association uh, started about five years ago, and they're very active. They promote wind energy. They have a part-time lobbyist. You know, I'm a member. I pay dues. And they, when we also uh, support federal policy initiatives. So doing that and, and saying, hey, this is what we need to do to continue to grow wind power and say that's an important thing to do. Somebody needs to do that. The legislature is politically divided right now, as you know, Democrats, Republicans, <clears throat> and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. If you have policies that are good right now and you don't want them to change, then sometimes it's okay to have the divided because they, they can't get anything done, you know? So uh, that's one advantage of having a politically divided. But we found out that wind power is generally supported by both Republicans and Democrats. And then another thing, I want to see a lot of winter there is. I want to ask you, how many of you, and just be very truthful and blunt with me, how many of you don't like to see a wind turbine on the horizon? Don't like to see a wind turbine out your back window because it's different. It's not natural. It's not the green prairie. How many of you don't prefer that? Yeah. I don't prefer to see the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one or two is fine, but if I see it across the whole field, it kind of takes away the It does. Right if forever change, it changes the horizon for about 30 years or whatever they're going to be up. I agree. So, but generally, we had one person out of 30 here that objected to it. And I would guess, you know, that might be reflective in general that most islands, you know, it's not a big deal. <clears throat> and and generally, I would don't complain about wind energy, just like Texans don't complain about oil loads. Because we now realize that why wind energy, why do they use it? Because it helps uh, provide electricity. And believe it or not, it has kept your electric bills down. You know, there's proof of that. At first, we didn't know if wind turbines were going to raise your electric rates or lower them. But it turns out that wind power is keeping electric rates down. The proof is in. Now, why is Iowa, why is Iowa number three in the United States with wind power? We're behind Texas is number one, we're behind California. It was a big state for a lot of people. Why is Iowa number three? Well, we had all these state policies. But there's a little bit bigger story to it. Here's a map of the wind speed uh, in the United States. The purple is the best. This is the worst. Iowa's got some good wind speed, but not as good as North Dakota and South Dakota and Kansas and Nebraska. Those states have a lot of purple land, <coughs> meaning they have the best wind resources. But Iowa's got enough. And if you look at where the people live, Iowa's got more people. Green is people. How many people we got out here in the states? <laughs> people. They're the ones that use the power. But Iowa's got kind of a mix of people and the good wind resources. And as a result, all these docks here are proposed wind farms that have been proposed in some of our bills. So it's a combination of having people that need electricity and having you know reasonably good wind resources. Now, how many of you have seen uh, pictures like this? Uh, you know, I don't know if this is India, where it is, I think it is. And, you know, and this is electricity and telephone and 
and communication cables. And that's what you call congested grid. Our transmission grid is right here. And it's the blue and the red lines. And you can see that where we have the best wind resources up here, you know, this blue line that we've got going through here, and this blue line carries about 200 megawatts each. 200 megawatt lines, these red lines are about 700 megawatt lines, but there's no red line going through here. And all of these lines generally carry power from the west to the east where the people are. Here's where most people use electricity, <clears throat> get up into <clears throat> Blackhawk, Waterloo, uh, Lynn County, Cedar Rapids, Johnson County over here, and Denver. Most electricity is used this side of the state. And the purpose of these transmission lines is to carry electricity from coal fired generation and hydroelectric power out of the west over there. So they don't have a lot of extra room on these lines for new power. And so we need more transmission lines so that, what's your name in Calhoun County? John. John. So that John can get his wind farm. Now. This is a map showing the price of power. Nobody sees this map, except if you're a power company. And it shows the price of power. For example, right at this particular time, the real time of price, every five minutes, the price of power in the grid changes. And for example, right at this particular time, it was like 1.5 cents a kilowatt hour in Michigan and 1.5 cents in Indiana. And the price of power is about the same everywhere in that in this area. Here's a day, and this happens quite often, where there's a big difference in the price of power. Uh, and up in here, we have a high price of power over Wisconsin. This could be right like 50 cents a kilowatt hour. And here, it was a, a negative one cent or a half a cent a kilowatt hour. The so price of power is negative. Wait a minute. How could the price of power be negative? <coughs> They're generating a surplus of energy more than what they use. Yeah. So what's it, what's it negative mean? Negative is, is if you rebate. It's like a re yeah, it's like a rebate. In fact, if you if you generate power into the grid, you have to pay them to take the power. That's terrible. So we have, but they work out a way to give price signals to say when to generate and not to generate. So negative here, positive here. What this is telling us is that. Boy, if you had a power line that went from here to here to transport, transport ex, extra power, which is caused by wind turbines, here you'd make a fortune. So that's the purpose of having real-time pricing. And as a result, a number of power lines have been proposed to be built. For example, here's another spot right there in Indiana. That's blue, that's negative, the cost of power is, is a negative there. Why is that? Anybody want to take a guess why there's a little spot in Indiana where the price of power is negative? Wind turbines. Yeah, how many have been to Indiana and seen this? They built a bunch of wind farms, didn't have it there before, and dumped wind turbines. So what's a wind turbine do? It lowers the cost of power on the grid. Wind turbines lower the cost of power on the grid. And so we have lower cost power here, higher cost here, built transmission lines in those data areas. So we have the mechanism now um, to do that, and so that's what's happening. And so in, today in Iowa, we have these proposed lines. I'm sorry that line didn't make it to Calhoun County, but it's close enough. It's close enough that <clears throat> wind turbines are probably built here, and that little line we built over here to this major transmission line. So this is what's being proposed to accommodate more wind power. <coughs> so how much wind power can Iowa really use? Well, today we have about 5,100 megawatts. Projects that have been announced over the next two years that will bring us up to about 6,500 megawatts, which will be about a third of our electricity in just two short years will be from wind power. And then we talked about proposed lines, a uh, number of proposed lines that would bring the total up to about 8,500 megawatts uh, if, they, if they all get built. And uh, this would provide about 50% of electricity needs. No other state will ever be that high. But uh, Iowa could get there. Question before you move on to that next yep. point. 
that last part there, you say, although part of that will be going to the states to the east and south of Iowa, yes. I'm surprised that they're not trying to keep it so that more of this power stays in, in the state to, to power the whole state. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Money. Well, because the politics, money. Nope. Iowa is not by itself in the grid. If you look at the grid, we work with about 10 states from what we call the Midwest Independent System Operator, MISO. In fact, MISO tells everybody in this six state area when all the power plant orders, when to generate, who should generate, and everybody bids a price in, hey, today I'll generate power and I'll charge you three cents a kilowatt hour. It's a bidding process. And everybody bids into a group. So we're, if you look at the power grid, there's no boundaries for Iowa. So it's just part of the bigger area. And so if more generations put in here, some of them will go to other areas just because it's cheaper in Iowa than it is in other areas that that power will go there. So it's because it's because of economics they, they work together and, and you know erase the state boundaries there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then the Iowa Wind Energy Association said 10,000 megawatts by 2020. That's what our goal is in 20,000 megawatts. Will Iowa ever reach these goals? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because I think we're going to discover a new energy source. So I think we're on the cusp of finding that right now. And I'm going to a conference in July, in two weeks. And uh, we're going to be talking about that energy source. Anyway. Uh, Care to expand well, <laughs> <laughs> after I get done with wind power, and then we'll talk about I see coming. Maybe uh, after lunch. After lunch. That's the whole that question. Though. Quick question. Yes. You want to elaborate on the DC line, or is that a proposed route? There's there's two proposed routes. One is across the northern part of Iowa, and it would be like the top two, the second tier of counties down go from. Uh, the northwest corner of O'Brien County and take off and over over to Wisconsin. Okay. Where, where, where are Wisconsin? Wisconsin? Um, if we want to hold our questions, we're going to have a speaker on that uh, DC line. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, we're, we've got a speaker. In which company is that? Who would that be? Uh, we're doing the uh, Rock Island Clean Line. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It'll tell you a lot more than I'll go to. So that's one of the lines of several across the United States that are being proposed. And, and that's, you know, They've been spending millions and millions of dollars. Hopefully, they can get that done. Switch gears. What is community wind power? Well, it is a community wind project like a single turbine. Like here's one at Waverly. How many of you have seen this right? Northwest of Waverly, northeast of Waverly. Yep, 900 kilowatt turbine there. <clears throat> and uh, the city of Waverly uh, put that up because they wanted to. They believed in wind power. They wanted to use more power from the renewable energy resources. Forest City, have you seen the wind turbine of Forest City? Uh, and uh, how about Eldora? How many of you have seen the wind turbine at Eldora? Only one person. That was a project I worked on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Minnesota and I went to school at Drake, so I drove by it. Oh, you did? Okay. Uh, paid for itself for seven years. <clears throat> and then uh, here's a wind project uh, that I was involved with, uh, seven uh, people owning, <coughs> part owners with a corporation uh, for seven large servers. <clears throat> here's two up in uh, Minnesota, Fairmont. Here's uh, one of the first wind turbines in Iowa. This is by the town, uh, by uh, the Royal, the Royal, yeah, Royal, the town of Royal, Iowa. It was a rebuilt turbine, not too cool looking turbine, but it was innovative for the, a small school to put that wind turbine in. And then here's another school in Minnesota, Lucky Parl, that uh, installed a wind turbine four years ago. So there are 12 Iowa schools and colleges, uh, and five in Minnesota that have wind turbines. And, and they all occurred because of uh, supportive public policies. We talked about <coughs> these already. But the state says, we need to encourage this. Let's do these things to support uh, schools that want to do that. <coughs> and they all end up saving significant amounts in their power bills. And one key thing that I discovered in all the projects I've worked on is that there's usually one guy, one person that shepherds this project through, that just 
refuses to give up. He's the champion. And it happens every project I've ever seen. It's one guy that just will not give up and say, we need to do this, we need to do this. So, and then we have wind turbines at, at farms. Here's one uh, by Southeast Iowa, and generally they farms uh, put them up because they just save enough uh, electricity in their power bill to pay for them. Oftentimes uh, the farmer likes wind turbines, and so he's willing to you know, maybe uh, do a project that other farmers wouldn't do. He's willing to take a little lower return on it, a little longer payback. But uh, all of, and here's one of the first large wind turbines put up by a farmer, uh, 1,500 kilowatt uh, turbine here on Strong Island. He, and he actually wanted to use this power to power a bunch of buildings. You can't see them all here because uh, a farrowing facility there. But it turned out that it just wasn't economic to offset his power bills. Instead, he just sold all the power to the utility uh, under a long-term contract. It just worked out better that way financially. Well. So farms use it. Businesses, we saw the wind turbine at Adair that's no longer there. Look at how close that is. <laughs> no engineer oh, wow. in his right mind would put a wind turbine that close. He'd just he'd fear the liability of something <clears> going on. Uh, and it's the economics of these depend in part of where it's at. There's the boondocks one uh, at the motel. They've had a number of mechanical problems with that one over the years. And, but generally, I found that the projects for businesses don't work because it's real simple. Does anybody want to take a guess why businesses choose not to invest in winter? Maintenance. Nope. Too much cost of maintenance. Nope. It's too just, long term. Too long term? Meaning what? Like it, it takes too long to get a return on your investments. Business op Businesses operate like on a quarterly profit model, so. Businesses like to get their money back in one or two or three or four years, right? Most businesses, corporations, wind turbines, the best payback I've ever seen is like a seven year payback. Most of them are 10 or 15 year paybacks. So businesses, not that they don't want to do it. I've done a lot of feasibility studies. Well, I've done one for Walmart, for one of their distribution centers. They look at the payback and says, well, we'd be crazy to do this. We have other places to put our money where we can get our money back in, you know, 18 months. Why would we invest in a wind turbine? So it's the payback. So uh, then we have wind turbines owned by cities, Wall Lake. This, I work with the uh, city council up there. This was a fun deal. These people said, we're going to do this. And uh, they, as a result, I went too fast here. As a result, they, uh, they ran into a problem. There was a height restriction due to the local airport. Now, how many of you have been in Wall Lake? You, you know, to the south, there's a little creek valley there. And you kind of go up the hill as you're going north. And here's this town kind of at the edge of the Creek Valley. And remember, have you seen the winter in Wall Lake? Mm -hmm. It's kind of up, uphill a little bit. And if you come in on that highway, coming from the south in Wall Lake, there's an airport right here, a runway. And if you look at the runway and look at the winter, it's lined right up. And normally, you have to be like five miles away from the end of a runway to put up a winter. And I mean, because they, they just don't want anything to glide past. So, there's a wind turbine there, the airport's still there. What do you think they did to get around that? Because the FAA said, no, you can't do this, you can't do this. So how did the, the city council was so determined to do this, what do you think they did? The airport's still there. Told me you have to fly in from a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> they changed the airport from a public use to a private use. And then the federal government doesn't regulate. And why did they do that? Well, there was only two guys that flew into the airport. And one of the guys was on the city council. And they asked him, you know, Joe, you know, if we put this wind turbine up here, you know, do you think you could miss it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then shoot, yes, yeah, it's no big deal. So, so what came first at Wall Like the ethanol plant that's down there or the wind turbine? When, do you know when that's all planned on I don't. We visited there. That's why I know it's there. Where is that small plant from the town there? It's on the south 
east side of town. I think it was this it was the winter because I don't remember it, the ethanol plant being there when I was working on the project. And then we have rural electric cooperatives. Uh, they often have long-term supply contracts to uh, to buy power, and so it's sometimes difficult for them to figure out how to incorporate uh, a wind turbine. But we have one. Iowa Lakes Electric Cooperative up in uh, Esterville. Esterville. They serve this ethanol cooperative. And think, what a neat idea. Renewable energy for a renewable fuel. So they put in those six wind turbines. First cooperative to really invest in wind generation in the United States. So they did that. So there's two facilities like this that I like to get. There was seven in that wind farm, wasn't there? Yeah, you're right, seven. You can see there's a stack. Yeah. Okay, you're right, seven stack. Yep. Yeah. And then Farmers Electric Cooperative. And down here in uh, Greenfield, Iowa, uh, worked with some farmers. I worked on this project. Fascinating project. Here, this farmer, Randy Cabins. It's a big old guy, you know, he didn't go to college or anything, and he started out broke, poor, and now he owns like 2,000 acres of land. Anyway, he just, one of those guys that's determined to do things. And he has organized uh, eight projects like this, eight single terms, like $3 million a piece there. And he gets people together and they put money in a pot, typically $15,000 a piece, or to, to $35,000 a share, depending upon the project. They put it in a pot, and then they borrow money, and then they build a turbine. This one guy is responsible for developing that, those uh, eight turbine projects. And they worked cooperatively with electric utility, and they said, hey, we think this is a good deal for you as a utility and your, and your customers. And the utility agreed, and so they, those projects came about. So the town of Fontenelle, the town of Greenfield, and the Rural Electric Cooperative here uh, in the town of Wildwood. Pretty much all the power down in that little area is pretty much all comes from wind power. <clears throat> but the economics uh, for municipal and cooperative wind projects are, are not as good as they are for most. Uh, utilities are willing to take longer term paybacks, Ten, typically 15 or 20 year paybacks. And sometimes a utility uh, you know, they can't because lots of local utilities like the town of Lennox, they're not profit. They can't use tax credits. And so they, it's more difficult to get the project to be economic. So they have a diff more difficult time of making the projects uh, economically feasible. And so I found that you, it's usually some guy in the utility, involved with the utility, that is the reason it goes. For example, the town of Lennox, it was the guy that ran, it was the pharmacist that ran the Rexall, have you ever heard of Rexall Pharmacy? Okay. He ran the Rexall Pharmacy. And he was on the board, the little board of trustees for the electric plant, and he started harping about, guys, we need to do something for our little town. Our little town's gonna die. We need to do something. And so he promoted this idea of winter. And the manager of the electric utility, Dave Ferris, he called me up and said, Tom, I know you involve the wind generation. I need to have you do a feasibility study for the town like Lennox to prove that it doesn't make sense for us to put up a wind turbine. And so I did a study, and it was, you know, it was a little marginal, but it would work. And lo and behold, today there's a wind turbine there. Why? Because of the pharmacist. In every one of these projects, it's, it's the same story. So, did the, is the town of Lennox going to get their money back? Yes. That term will probably pay back in about 12 years. And so it's close to being paid back now. Any questions? Okay. Uh, let's get through this here. So, state policies are key to community win. Uh, policies are required because uh, usually if you want to put, for example, here's that first wind turbine that was installed. It's just five miles from here. It's a 225 kilowatt that Harold Overman got in the ground for the very close. That's not the windy spot in Iowa. And buying one wind turbine is a lot more expensive than buying a hundred wind turbines. And 
hauling a big crane in here to install one wind turbine costs more than if you can haul a crane in and install 100 wind turbines like that. And so there's single turbine projects or one turbine at a time, they cost more per turbine because of economies of scale. So there wouldn't be very many of these turbines if we didn't have single turbines like this, if we didn't have state policies that supported it. And so the state of Iowa the legislature said, hey, this is important. We think this has value to the state. And we think in the long run, they pay for themselves. So uh, policies, the state of Iowa has, has, has passed these policies of all the net billing uh, and uh, tax credits. And they justify it because they say that these local projects return more money to the community. And, th and they do. So state policy is needed, net metering. Uh, we, need to, we need to somehow address this problem with the demand charges, the peak, peak cost for, uh, in your power bill for larger facilities. Uh, there are state production incentives. Uh, that's, that's the project that I'm involved with. It receives the state production incentives. And uh, there's other uh, incentives that, that have been passed to make uh, these small projects work. So, Tom, those yes. are the policies that are needed. Um, how likely are we to see those policies enacted, and what can our 16 teachers do to encourage their local legislators to support that kind of policy? Well, Iowa has done most of these already. We have. Yes. This is the only one that is we've not addressed. For example, a uh, larger, uh, for example, Grinnell College, how many of you have been to Grinnell College? How many, did any of you go to Grinnell College? They've been trying to uh, do a large wind turbine because their president signed a commitment that, yes, uh, Grinnell College will reduce its carbon footprint, and just like Luther College has. And after a number of studies, Grinnell College said, hey, Besides changing out light bulbs, and changing into fluorescent and using efficiency, that's the cheapest thing we can do. After that, the next cheapest thing we can do to reduce our carbon footprint is put up a big wind turbine. But the economics weren't very good because they put it behind the meter so they reduced their, their, their purchases from, from a lion. But there'll be some days when the wind turbine doesn't blow and the, the, uh, college will set a peak usage for that day and then they'll pay on that peak usage for the month. So it's the fact that uh, there's no credit for um, uh, the wind turbines uh, being able to, the wind turbines simply just don't offset the village and the demand charges. So, I think one state has addressed this. I think this is the state of Massachusetts that has addressed this issue. And so if you look at all of the policies that are out there to encourage community wind power, Iowa's got done most of them. You know, and we have a home run if we address that one issue with the demand charge. So what happens is that large customers, people who use a lot of electricity, it's difficult for them for the payback. Uh, difficult for them to justify it and invest in the winter because of the payback. So what could we do? Just make sure that uh, the legislature doesn't undo any of these, I guess is the best thing. You know, I can't complain as an Iowan about what uh, Iowa uh, does for supporting the power. We're really a very good state. What's going to happen to the wind industry if all the incentives go away? I and, think, what, and do you think that would ever happen? It, it will happen. It will happen. And the price of wind power has been coming down from the time in California when the first wind turbines installed up out there, they were you know running at 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Today, a large wind farm, a new wind farm in Iowa, is about three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. A new, if the new coal-fired power plant that Alliant wanted to build, which they they backed away from it was going to be 10 cents a kilowatt hour. A nuclear power plant was likely to be something over 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Wind power is three and a half. 
That's width in centimeters. So you take the incentive away and you add about two cents. So it'd be like five and a half cents without the incentive. So is that competitive? I think so. So we're about there. We're just about there. And uh, as far as the incentives for community wind, uh, I think if you take those incentives away, they'll probably, you won't see very many more community wind. They're just a little bit more expensive. But that's all right. We still get a lot of our electricity from wind power. So there will come a day, and I think it should happen too, that, uh, and I think Obama uh, has, you know, he's brought up this issue with incentives for the oil industry. And he says, you know, there's tax incentives for the oil and fossil fuel industries. They've been on the books for a long time. If you want to do away with that, then that's fine. But if you don't want to do away with that, then you need to also provide incentives for renewable energy. You need to put them on a level playing field for tax, tax incentive wise. So he's saying either get rid of these or keep giving the incentives for renewable energy. And that makes sense to me. So I think the day will come that everybody will get their incentives to take them off. Well, we're just, I think this is the last slide. Federal policies, uh, this is detailed stuff that normally I don't. I wouldn't talk to you. So, the last slide I have is uh, state legislatures need to be convinced that the benefits from local ownership of wind generation are offset the cost of incentives or mandates. We made this case to the state legislatures, later in the state of Iowa, and they agreed, and so that's why we have the state uh, one and a half cent tax credit. They said it was worth it to the state. Here's a view off the top of the winter, and if you climb the winter, you saw a view like this. this is Fall. This is a winter in Armstrong, Iowa. What a wonderful view! I just love every time I climb a winter and I get at the top of the cell. I sit up there and I try to sit up there for a few minutes. And I look at the shadow of the blade going across the crops, and I look and see how many water towers I can see in the distance, and to see the shades of different green of, of Iowa. It's just a beautiful sight. So that's my presentation. <laughs>